Okay, supposedly we're live. Uh, it's on my Google Plus, but I don't know. Like, she can see it. Okay. So, uh, I read game intro. I'm Luke Kimhoff. I work at Rapid7. Uh, in my spare time, I work on the JetBrains uh, plugin for Elixir, IntelliJ Elixir. And so, if you like RubyMine, you can do the same thing in Elixir. But just to be clear, I don't work for JetBrains, and I barely understand their API. It's mostly reading their open source plugins for how I figured it out. So the reason why an Elixir talk is at Austin RB is because the last talk by Jim Freeze mentioned Elixir at the end, and people showed interest. And that's why we're, <laughs> why we're uh, giving this talk now, because it piqued the interest of the group to see it. Additionally, this isn't just like, a, hey, convert languages talk. At uh, Rapid7, we have Metasploit, and that's a 10-year-old open source Ruby project. We're not going away from Ruby. But there are places in the actual Rails app or in the more professional products where we think Elixir is a good choice, mostly because the equivalent of uh, Rails for Elixir Phoenix has much better WebSocket support and much better uh, concurrency support than the action cable proposal for Rails 5. And so we're looking into Phoenix and Elixir for that reason. So a brief outline of the talk. I'm going to start from nothing. Like These slides would hopefully work for you after the talk to get you up and running. So it's going to go through installation, how to get the equivalent of IRB up, what are some of the types in the language, how to do control flow, um, what is pattern matching, how to set up a project, how code is organized, how to do testing, how to do metaprogramming, finally concurrency, and then um, some mapping between resources you may know in the Ruby community to resources that you may want to look at in Elixir if you like those sort of resources, and then uh, some announcements at the end. Elixir is a functional language that is dynamically typed using immutable data that is highly concurrent. MRI Ruby's go-to concurrency approach of forking a process has too high of an overhead and is only tolerable in systems with copy and write fork, which excludes Windows. A lot of people don't care about Windows. We have to care about Windows because our app, even though it's a Rails server, has to run on people's laptops if need be for uh, on-premise uh, penetration testing where you hire a contractor to go test the security of your network and it has to run on their laptop. So Windows compatibility is a huge, important thing for our use case. Threading fibers in MRI cannot get around the guild, the global interp interpreter lock, and so only help with IO bound code. On the other hand, Elixir uses the Erlang v VM, also known as Beam, which, thanks to the immutable data, can run isolated processes inside the VM so fast and so cheaply that my laptop can use as many as I want effectively and use a separate one for each logically concurrent task. So unlike threading in Ruby or threading in Java or threading in most languages where you have to decide, is it worth spawning a thread for this to make it parallel, you don't have to make that decision in Erlang or Elixir. You, if you can logically say this should happen concurrently or can happen concurrently or parallel, just do it, and you'll be fine. Just as you learned imperative programming over mathematical thinking, you can retrain to think in functional languages and even switch back and forth. I currently switch between Java, Ruby, and Elixir. With only a few hiccups on namespace syntax and string coding, if you're used to using map or select from renewable in Ruby, you are already using functional programming. If you ever use class methods in Ruby that didn't write to class or instance variables, you're already using functional programming. Learning functional programming will also prepare you for the future. If you watch the conference talks in other languages, such as JavaScript or C++, languages are moving to have more and more functional features as the programming community adapts to the mini cores feature. They've figured out that locks, threads, and shared mutable state is too error prone. Moore's law. Increase, of increasing processor speed stopped 10 years ago. You may not really have thought of that. You may have been too used to having computers now, but we stopped the gigahertz race 10 years ago now. Like, until I actually thought back to it, I didn't realize it had been that long. If you want to take advantage of Moore's laws now and in the future, you need to write concurrent programs now that can be parallelized across the additional cores of the future automatically. So concurrency is these tests can run at the same time. Parallelism is they are actually running at the same time. Switching from imperative 
Mutable object-oriented Ruby to functional immutable concurrent Elixir may be intimidating, but I'll show you how easy it is to translate your Ruby skills to Elixir to quickly get started learning Elixir on your own. So if anyone understands the Ruby side and they don't need me to explain it, just be allowed to skip it and we can go faster. So I'll cover how to do installation on the different OSs. It's uh, pretty equal. Ruby and Elixir both have homebrew packages and version managers. In Ruby, you have RVM and RBM. I list RVM here just because it's the one I use. And there's the equivalent of KIEX for uh, Elixir. The only caveat is, is because Elixir is built on top of Erlang, you have to use a separate version manager called curl to manage the versions of Erlang underneath. For Windows, there's Ruby Installer or Elixir Web Setup. They both, you know, install it as a program. Very nice. There, also, if you use the package manager for Windows called Chocolatey or otherwise NuGet, there are packages for it on the app. For Linux, there's too many package managers on Linux, but your package manager will have packages for Ruby and Elixir, or you can use the same uh, setup that you would for uh, OSX. So for the using it interactively, uh, in a REPL, we'll go over how to start the REPL, how to break out when you write bad when you write code that you don't want to enter, and how to exit out of the shell. So in Ruby, the interactive terminal is IRB. In Elixir, it's IEX, so Interactive Ruby or Interactive IEX. Same name as Uh Breaking the current command is slightly more complicated, though, in Elixir, because in Elixir, if you do Control-C, you actually get control of the entire VM, and you can list out the processes. It's kind of like getting access to top when you Control-C. So to kill, if you're typing code and you have an error, you instead do a comment with ix colon break on it, and it'll kill the current line you're typing in. That took me a while to find. It is technically in the docs. I just did not read the manual. Um, so that, that's a good thing to remember. So to exit out of IRB, you just type exit. It just looks like a method call. Uh, for Elixir, you do Control-C to get the VM control menu, and then Control-C again to exit all the way out of the process. So we'll go over types next. Integer formats are the same for Ruby and Elixir. They both support decimal, binary, octal, and hexadecimal. You can use underscore to separate digit groups. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's aware of that in Ruby even, but you can't use commas in Ruby to separate like the thousands place, but you can use underscore in numbers. And Elixir has the same thing. Um, they also both have, both have e-notation if you're doing scientific notation to do floats. For constants is where we start to see some divergence. Um, so what Ruby calls a symbol, uh, Elixir calls an atom. And that name atom is inherited from Erlang. Uh, class and module names are camel cased, and namespaces are separated with double colon in Ruby, while aliases are separated with a dot. Additionally, the Erlang module names are just atoms. Aliases are called aliases because they are actually syntactic, syntactic sugar uh, with an atom starting with elixir dot. So like my module, uh, my namespace dot my module is actually the atom colon elixir dot my namespace dot my module. And that's needed if you want to call elixir code from Erlang the same way that using colon all lowercase Erlang module allows you to call the uh, Erlang modules from elixir. Uh, there aren't really constants in Elixir, but there is this thing called module attributes. Your brain may read module attributes as being like a class instance variable, since they both start with an at and look like a variable, but module attributes don't get assigned with an equals sign. Instead, they are referenced before the value to put, put into the module attribute. This is because module attributes can be converted to either reset their value or accumulate all values passed to them. So it's more like a, um, almost like a function call that you can dynamically define. Uh, and this allows some nice features later on for metaprogramming. Uh, the Boolean types are the same, and Ruby and Elixir both have falsy logic. So both nil and false are falsy for like if and unless, et cetera.
Ruby and Elixir support double code strings with interpolation in code as UTF-8. They both use the same interpolation symbol of a hash and then curly braces. Uh, they both support UTF-8. But Elixir's Unicode support is much better. So Jose Belim is the creator of Elixir. And he was on the Rails core team. And now he works on Phoenix and started Elixir. And I don't know if this is one of the reasons why he started Elixir. But upcase in, in Ruby doesn't capitalize his name correctly. The E with the, the acute accent remains lowercase when you do upcase in Ruby, but it gets properly capitalized in Elixir. Additionally, if you have um, E with an acute accent as two characters in Unicode, so you can actually type E with an acute accent as like E followed by an acute accent, and that's called a combined accent, and actually renders on top of the E. And so that happens a lot when people are typing um, in languages other than English that actually have a lot of accents. Um, and so in Ruby, it thinks that's two characters. But Elixir has support for grapheme, so it says that you're, you're string like this one because that's what the user actually sees. And that's because that's it counts graphemes, which are the actual visual representation. And the reason why they're able to do this is Elixir actually encodes the entire uh, Unicode database into its standard library. So it's able to capitalize the entire Unicode, including emoji, because emoji is just very big Unicode characters. Like, they have a very large byte uh, number. But Unicode it contains emoji. They're not pictures. Uh, regular expressions, uh, it's the same. There's slightly more syntaxes in Elixir because Regular expressions are generalized uh, part syntax of uh, sigils. So there's all these ways of, you can just do matching braces for sigils. So curly braces, uh, square brackets, angle brackets, double quotes, uh, forward slash, uh, parentheses, pipes, single quotes. Um, you do regex.compile bang for doing it programmatically, though. and uh, G sub in Ruby would be regex.replace in Elixir. They both have anonymous functions. So Ruby has a lot of syntaxes. They have stabby lambda. They have actual lambda. They have proc the keyword. They have proc.new. And return behaves differently in all of them a little bit. Um, it has two calling conventions, dot .call, uh, dot parentheses, oh, and also the hash looking syntax of square brackets. I don't know if people actually knew that on Ruby, but that is the thing you can do. Um, Elixir is slightly simpler. The anonymous functions are just fn. Um, they use a stab to separate the parameters from the actual code. They're ended with end. Uh, the other option is you can do what's called a capture, which is where it uses the ampersand symbol. And then you just do named positional arguments, the, like one and two, as you see. And the only calling convention is dot parentheses in Elixir. Uh, collections, the mismatch is a little bit uh, different because Elixir has more data types than Ruby standard library does. Ruby standard library is kind of limited for um, data types compared to like the Java standard library. Arrays and tuples are both contiguous in memory, but tuples are fixed size while Ruby arrays are resizable. Both allow lookup by index. Uh, both set and hash set are built on top of hashes and don't support a built-in syntax for initialization. And so here are populated using an array and linked list, respectively, as you can uh, see here. So here you're actually making a list first, and then set's consuming it. Here I'm making a linked list first, and then I'm putting it into the hash set. Um, there are no built-in linked lists in uh, Ruby, uh, and that has actually come up as an optimization target because tender love in Ruby gems actually did some of the um, state tracking with linked lists instead of arrays because arrays were so inefficient. Um, and then there's also keyword lists in Elixir, which allows you to have hash like syntax, but multiple um, values for the same key. But this is just uh, really syntactic sugar for a list of tuples. So it's not a fast lookup like a hash would be. Moving on to control flow, both languages have 
if, unless, um, but for Elixir, and, and if, else if, else if, and else and chain um, becomes the cond, and that just matches, each one of these is a, a Boolean. So like, if one is true, two is true. Otherwise, the, the else is just always true, so you just actually say true. And that's kind of inherited from um, functional programming in Lisp, which uses con. Um, you should take note that these look really alike, but there's a do there, and there's a do there. Uh, I'll get to why there are do's in Elixir uh, later. One sec. So for rescuing exceptions, uh, sorry, this is small. Does anyone want me to zoom in? I can try to do that. Uh, yeah, that would yeah, be small. Small. Okay, so, so I'm not sure if everyone's aware of uh, Sorry, guys, the zoom power doesn't work uh, on the TV. Oh, crap, it zoomed my other screen. Um, okay. So in Ruby, uh, the begin rescue box for handling exceptions starts with begin. You can rescue a, a given class name and capture its instance into a variable. You can rescue just that class name and be like, I don't care about the actual error. I just want to stop this error from propagating. You can also be like, I don't care about the class, but I want it in a variable so I can look at it. And finally, you can rescue. Uh, both rescue, capture new exception, and rescue by itself captures um, standard error and not exception. Standard error is more like the errors that you as a programmer should care about. Stuff directly on exception is like out of memory and that sort of thing that you should let the VM just crash or handle on its own. Um, both uh, languages have an else clause, which is run this if there was no error in the part between the begin and rescue or the try and do in Elixir. The enter block is, this always runs. So enter is usually used to like free up resources, like close a file, or to um, close a connection, or maybe give back a, a uh, checkout from the database pool. And so that's enter in Ruby and after in Elixir. And both of them end with the keyword end. Besides exceptions, there's a more esoteric uh, construct in Ruby and Elixir called a catch and a throw. The only case I can think of, of them being used in production is in part of Rack, uh, because you can throw from somewhere in the middleware stack and just have your request immediately stop and return. In Elixir, catch and throw is only meant for use when you can't send a message up the stack any other way. However, Elixir's catch is far more flexible, as throw and catch don't have to agree on a single symbol to match on the way in Ruby. So the catch construct in Ruby, you have to say, catch. I'm going to catch just the symbol done, or the string done. And then if throw done happens, then I'll stop here. But if it's a different symbol, you won't catch it. In Elixir, you can catch on any pattern of stuff. So here I throw hello with a given name, and I can get that hello, capture in a greeting, and name, and then I can print. Um, right here, I can be like, hello to you, Alice. And so it's much more flexible uh, than the Ruby construct. Uh, Catch and exit are used all the time to monitor VM processing and exiting. VM processing and monitoring each other is part of the resiliency feature of Elixir. So you can start a process and say, I'm going to monitor that other process. And if it crashes, you're, you're notified of it on the VM level. So there's not a need to have like God or monitor. It's built into the Erlang VM of, I can monitor another process that I'm supervising. You may have also noticed that rescuing exceptions and catching throws and exits all use try. It is actually possible to rescue exceptions and catch throws and exits all in the same try, so there's not a um, separate construct the way there is in Ruby. So for pattern matching, we'll show uh, the difference between converting an assignment to a match, uh, destruction in Ruby to match, and also argument errors to match. So a loss of met just maps to match when you switch to Elixir. Um, how do you use pattern matching in function clauses, and then how to convert if-elses in Ruby to case statements in Elixir. 
In Elixir, the equal sign is the match operator. The match operator should not be thought of as an assignment, but instead of trying to get the two sides of the equal sign to match, which is why you can do foo equals one or one equals foo. However, after already doing foo equals one, you can't do two equals foo because the match operator will only rebind a variable if it's on the left-hand side. And Ruby can't ever have variables and literal values uh, on step two or three that way, and there are syntax errors. So in Ruby, you can do uh, something called destructuring. Everyone may have done it to break up arrays. So you can do a comma b, and it will take the first value in the array becomes a, the second value in the array becomes b. Uh, in Elixir, you could do the equivalent with tuples and bind them to a and b. In Ruby, you can use un and Elixir, you can use underscore to be like, this should be filled in as a variable, but throw the value away. I don't care, and don't give me a warning that I'm not using the value. So we can do the same thing here to only capture the, val the second value of b and throw away the one as the first value. And finally, we can say, I want the first value from the array or the linked list, and I want the rest in another value. So here we do b splat in Ruby. And in Elixir, if we use a linked list, we can use pipe, and then b becomes the tail. So a is referred to as the head, and then b is referred to as the tail. And in linked list, it's always the value, and then a pointer to the next node in the linked list, and it all looks the same. So that's why b, why you can get the rest as one object. Finally, if you want to do, if you need to check your arguments, and you normally um, want to check that, like, you get a and b, as we showed previously, and then you want to make sure that a equals 1 or calling this function is invalid, well, you'd have to check the value. You'd have to get it out of the array, check the value, and then raise an argument error. In Elixir, you can just say that's how you want the pattern to look. And so I can just put the value 1 in place, and it'll say it can't, it can't match up 1 with 0. And so it, it will fail with a match error. That's actually a really common way to check like a, um, a an IO function in Elixir is it'll either return OK and the result, or it'll return error and the actual error you got. So if you just do OK, that's the way you can do like file read bang in Ruby is like you will you'll error out if it doesn't do what you expect to happen right away. And you don't have to write special code to do that. You just match it with a pattern. Additionally, the patterns aren't just fill in this variable, fill in this variable, fill in this variable. You can also, if you repeat a variable, you can make sure that the two locations in the pattern are the same. So if we wanted to check that the opening and closing tags of XML or HTML, if we were writing a parser match, we pull them out of the array, and then we'd have to, in Ruby, actually check, are they equal? If they're not, then throw an argument error. In Elixir, we can just say, OK, take that tuple and say they use the variable tag twice, and that will be like saying these two uses of tag must be the same. Using pattern matching, we can have a function behave differently based on its inputs without the need to write our own conditional logic. In Ruby, we're stuck with a case statement, unless argument is a class, or and the response can be made polymorphic. So, Obviously, don't do this on the first argument if you can make it a class. That's not good OO. But if your class is already a cat and you have to figure out how you greet people differently, um, you'd have to use a case statement. So here, if, if the cat sees the owner, it's going to purr. If it sees a dog, it's going to hiss at it. And if it sees anyone else, it's just going to ignore them, because that's what cats do. Uh, in Elixir, instead, if we can just define the function with three clauses and say, if we get the value, if we get the owner symbol, then we're going to purr. If we get the dog symbol, we're going to hiss. And using underscore to mean we don't care, um, we'll just ignore them. And the reason to do this pattern matching on function definitions is the compiler is very efficient about spotting um, prefixes in the patterns you write and constructing a very efficient tree. So if you had a bunch of prefixes on strings or on tuples or on like packets, the compiler for you will automatically figure out the most efficient way to check like a common prefix and then fork from there. And so it's very fast to do this dispatching. Instead of you having to hand tune like a hash lookup or something like that, the compiler will just do that for you.
In Ruby, the case statement uses a uh, triple equals operator to allow win clauses to match either the exact value or be of the same class or regex match to the arg argument to win. In Elixir, case statements are a way to match a bunch of patterns in order the same way as with function clauses. So here's a way to get rid of conditional logic for fizzbuzz, because everyone loves fizzbuzz. Uh, so we're doing the same pattern, and we're going to get, is it divisible by 3? That's fizz. If it, is it divisible by 5? That's buzz. So if it's fizz and buzz, it must be fizzbuzz. Else if it's only fizz, it's fizz. Else if it's only buzz, it's buzz. Else we give n. And we can do the same thing, but almost, look at it. It's like a truth table here. So we give, is it divisible by 3, is it divisible by 5, or n? If we get 0, 0, and whatever for n, we say fizzbuzz. If we get 0, and whatever for the other two, it's buzz. If we get 0 for divisible by 5, then it's buzz, otherwise we return n. So this is almost like looking at like a, a truth table in logic. So it's much more obvious, the pattern, and you're not having to read down the code. You can just look at it as a table. Now, yes, fizzbuzz is a constructed example, and this is rare that this actually happens, but it's nice when it does. So let's move on to actually writing Elixir code and how we would start a project. So Ruby has a lot of tools. Uh, unlike Ruby, where you need to know whether to use bundle, jam, or rake, everything is a mixed task in Elixir. And this is more of a side effect of um, mix was there at the beginning of Elixir, and Elixir is not that old. Uh, Ruby, um, bundle had to be invented. Jam had to be invented. Rake had to be invented. Those were all came up later, and so there wasn't <coughs> Uh, a community emphasis on, hey, everyone use the same tool. Uh, mixed tasks are uh, namespace just like rate tasks, but mixed tasks use a dot instead of a colon. Um, most of gem commands map to mix archive namespace tasks. Most bundle commands map to mix steps, except for outdated, which um, is mix hex dot outdated. Any gem commands interacting with rubygems.org are mapped to mix hex tasks because rubygems.org equivalent is hex.pm. So, Elixirs, we get hexes, we get um, we get HTTP poison and instead of HTTP potion, you know. So there's some dark magic involved, you know. So for Ruby, uh, now with the current version of RVM, at least you have to gem bundle uh, install bundler first because RVM doesn't do that for you anymore, and then you have to bundle gem example. And I'm using the newest bundler here, which is like uh, bundler 1.10, which allow people may have been avoiding because of the changes they made to the lock file format. Um, but now there is a code of contact and whether you want to use the MIT license as a prompt and what sort of testing you want so there's more uh, command line options. You could just do bundle gem example and it would just give you interactive prompts. Uh, for Elixir, it's just mixed new example because they haven't gone to the uh, extra features of uh, automatically setting up your license, that sort of thing. Uh, for, both, for file layout, both Bundle gem and mix new handle git ignores a stubs packaging file. So example .gem spec for Ruby and mix .exs for Elixir. Um, in version 1.10, bundler really stepped up his game and now prompts for code of conduct, which is the CLC flag. Uh, license and automatically generates uh, .travis.yaml for travisci.org, which I think is great because because Travis will catch so many of your bugs um, because works on my machine. You're right on Mac. Travis's Ubuntu, you will catch so many um, like file system ordering bugs because OSX is always in order, uh, and uh, Ubuntu will be in whatever order the files were in. So always use Travis CI or Semaphore or Circle. Just use continuous integration whenever possible, or Jenkins if you want to keep it internal. Um, unlike Bundler's gem file and, and RubyGems gem spec, there's not split packaging and dependency management in Elixir. Everything is in mix.exs. Additionally, the version of the Project is stored directly in mix.exs instead of being in a separate file like lib slash example slash version rb. Uh, as you can see at the top of mix.exs is a standard Elixir module under the project's example namespace. So the version can be extracted from mix. Uh, from example.mix file dot project at runtime without uh, the need for a separate version file like Ruby's lib slash example dot version rb constants. The app keyword right here in the project function 
uh, gives the entirety of this project a name that can be used to include this project in other project releases. The applications list, located down here, the, uh, is for projects that are dependent on at runtime. In Erlang and Elixir, applications are libraries or trees of VM processes that are started as a group to provide some service to other applications. So you can have an application that is a, a web server, and it just has this application name. Um, one of the ones that Phoenix uses is called Cowboy. And you can just bring it up, and you can say, I depend on Cowboy, the same way that you would say, I depend on like the Postgres server running in your init script for your Ruby app. But that's all built into the VM. Like The Erlang VM has so many nice features because it was made um, to work on embedded systems like phones without OSs, that a lot of features that you would have to be like, I need to go outside of Ruby. In Elixir and Erlang, you can just be like, well, I can just do that in the VM. The version keyword in the project function uh, states the name of this project when it was released as an application or published to Hex. Uh, as I said previously, hex.pm is the Elixir equivalent of rubygems.org. Um, the depths function lists the dev, prod, and our test uh, compile time dependencies. Because Ruby Gems and Bundler grew up after Ruby was, was started, their individual responsibilities for dependencies overlap. So if you have a runtime dependency, you could put in either one. But if you put in gem spec, then stuff down the dependency chain knows about it. If you put in gem file, it's hidden, even though you need it to run it in the, the default group in production, which can lead to bugs. Um, both of them support getting uh, code a dependency directly from uh, GitHub. And um, both of them also support getting uh, a local copy from a path. Uh, either one can support uh, development uh, dependencies. Uh, Gemspec, of course, doesn't know anything about test groups, uh, so you can't use it there. Oh, I should have a coding bug. Um, and it's pretty similar. The only difference in Elixir is Development is just called dev, but test is test in both languages. Uh, for advanced features, uh, if you are using Bundler 1.10 plus, you'll have access to optional gems. Otherwise, you only get declared optional dependencies using Mix. Uh, Bundler has no mechanism for a project to override a version conflict between its dependencies dependencies. So not the dependencies you declare, but if you depend on a gem, and it has another dependency, and then you depend on another gem, and they both indirectly have the same one, but they have a version conflict, you can't fix that in Ruby. You have to fork, or you have to yell at those upstream projects to be like, make your stuff compatible. Um, Elixir instead lets you, if you do override true, you can be like, actually, for the use case I'm using, I know these two are compatible, so just use this version which can save you a lot of trouble and prevent you from needing to fork while you go yell at upstream to fix their dependencies. So we know how to set up a project, how to declare dependencies. Let's move on to the actual code. So Ruby and Elixir modules look pretty similar. Modules becomes def module. Uh, there's also an extra do all over the place. So there's do there, do, do. Um, there are no objects and therefore no instance methods in Elixir. So while def self dot is needed in Ruby to say this is a module method, in Elixir, let's just assume there are only modules. There are no classes. So def just works to declare a module method. And you can see the invocation is the same. We can do invocation with parentheses or with no parentheses. In the Ruby example here, I'm using yard docs because it's more structured and feature rich than rdoc. Um, while yard docs are stuck in the comments, documentation and type annotations are first class and retained in the compiled module uh, in Elixir. You can access the help in IEX with the h uh, function, which is just obviously help. So you can do like help kernel and it'll list all the methods on kernel. If you want to generate HTML, you can use xdoc package and publish it to hexdocs.pm. Docs are pushed to hexdocs.pm from your computer instead of being automatically generated, like on rubydoc.info. So you can do things uh, you can't do on rubydoc.info, like publish docs for a private package, or generate docs using your own plugins, which are blocked from running on 
rubydoc.info. Like if you want a yard plugin, like say the ones that support Rails to run on rubydoc.info, you have to open an issue and petition them like, hey, this code is safe. Please run them when you generate my docs for me in rubydoc.info. Otherwise, you're forced to host your own documentation on your own server. Uh, type annotations are optional, but if given, can be used with uh, a tool called Dialyzer to check if the types given match the expected and return values from the real functions and any functions that call those functions using a strategy called success typing. So if you take in a, if your code shows that it's using a variable that's five, bam, your number. If you return five, oh, you must return numbers. Like you don't have to declare the types if you don't want to. It'll just figure that out for you. Uh, this is uh, similar to the move towards gradual typing that has been talked about uh, for uh, Ruby 3 or for the different uh, gradual typing in different JavaScript languages. Uh, given the specs here is mostly a form of documentation, so callers for the code know that it works on both floats and integers and not just um, when I say number. For reading the documentation, like I said, you can use the h function. So I can do h on a module like math and get the uh, the module doc that was here. Or I can do h on an individual function and get the at doc that's above that function. And finally, if I want to see the types, there is a s function. And it's s because the, the types are called specs. They're type specs. So s is the thing and not t. Um, in Elixir, a function can have multiple defs, allowing uh, functional overloading like in Java. But, it, but instead of matching on class or interface, the overloading works based on pattern matching. Here, the clauses are matching on the atom and number of elements in the tuple. When is number r is a guard. So um, guards are used to restrict the type of parameters allowed or to enforce relationships between variables in a pattern that can't be expressed directly in the pattern shape. So if you want two different variables, a and b, but you still want them to be equal, you could do uh, a comma b when a double equals b. And that's allowed. Um, using uh, tag tuples where like the quote unquote type is the first thing, like rectangle here and circle here, um, is one of the ways of adapting polymorphic code in Ruby uh, with different implementations, different classes to Elixir. Uh, the tag tuple format comes from Erlang, but Elixir has access to a better form of polymorphism with structs and protocols. Uh, you may have heard of protocols in Clojure, or uh, Swift also has protocols. So very popular now. Instead of using the, can everyone, okay, yeah. Instead of using the tag tuple format for functional overline, structs can be used. Structs have the benefit of being built on top of maps, so they allow lookup of field names instead of in the indexes allowed by tuples. Like maps, the compiler will error if a field is not on a struct. So um, there is a compiler in Elixir, and it'll check certain things. It, it'll check if you have a struct and you do like a dot name field when, oh, you actually called it username. It'll error out on that, uh, because it knows the, um, the structure of the struct from the def struct uh, instruction there, which is nice. It catches subtle bugs that we kind of just got used to checking with unit tests in Ruby. Um, here, each module defines the, the struct for the given shape and their respective area calculations. So we have a rectangle that has a height and a width. Uh, we use the, the module keyword to, just so they don't have to type rectangle again in case we change the name later. Um, and then we say we take its height, put in the height variable. We take its width, put in the width variable. So this is like uh, required keyword arguments in Ruby, but you have to say the key and then the variable to bind it to. You can't just say the key by itself like you could in Ruby with required arguments. Circle is similar. It's a module called circle. We define a struct with def struct, but circles only have a radius. We grab the radius, and we do pi r squared using multiplication. And uh, this is small math with a colon because the math uh, library actually comes from Erlang. So the way the libraries are set up is if the Erlang library is well-structured, and well-structured by meaning the subject of the function is the first argument, you're going to use the Erlang library. If it's poorly structured, like the list library, Elixir will give you a better version of the library. So like capital L list is the one used in Elixir. Um, and that way, it's easier to use, because you know the actual list you're manipulating is the first argument. And that wasn't the case 
in Erlang because there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, convention or discipline, I guess. Oh, I, I should mention that if a key is not mentioned for a struct or a map, it's just ignored. It's not saying, like, if I left off with here, it wouldn't be that you can only have a height. It would be, I just don't care about the width. Which also means that if you use an empty, if you use percent curly braces, that's not an empty map. That is any map. And if you want to, uh, if you want to check that, there's a guard to check the size of the map, so you could be like, this must be an empty map or an empty struct. Um, so structs got us an area for a circle and rectangle, but now, in addition to creating a rectangle or a circle, we also have to know that in order to get the area, we have to call it on the rectangle module. So we make a rectangle, then we call rectangle that area. We make a circle, we call circle that area, but that's annoying. That's not polymorphism. That's like C. That's horrible. Um, how do we get back to calling just uh, geometry area, like we did in the pattern matching example? Well, that's where protocols come in. <laughs> the protocol definition looks like an interface in Java, but there's a difference. Um, you want so, to like close your chat, must because it's probably getting record. It's getting recorded. Oh. <laughs> You're not saying anything terrible. Yeah, we're public now. I better set that up. <laughs> OK. Um, so we say def protocol for a shape. We can document it and give the spec. But this is a def with no body. There's no do end here. So it, like I said, it's a lot like an interface in Java. Um, Unlike interfaces, a type, be it a built-in like string or a struct like circle, does not need to know about the protocol for an implication to exist for that protocol. So if you if shape was pre was already defined, and then we wrote rectangle, we could just define the implementation for shape directly in here and just say, okay, shape, if a shape's area, when it's a rectangle, is just called rectangle that area. So it just goes back here. But if the protocol shape came around in code outside of when we knew about circle, we could say def implementation shape with the keyword for and then the module name circle and say how to do that. Um, this means that a struct can be defined in one project, a protocol in another project, and it's only a third project where the implementation exists and the protocols can be used on the struct. Um, so that uh, don't confuse this for monkey patching or open classes in Ruby. The protocols dynamically check for implementations, but the protocol struct and implementations are all in separate Elixir modules. Modules aren't, uh, can't be opened or redefined. Um, so this means you don't have to go searching for monkey patches, but you still can extend classes with protocols if needed. Um, Ruby doesn't do tail call optimization unless a compilation flag is enabled and read in code. So most Ruby code avoids recursion. So, uh, recursive solutions in favor of iteration to prevent the stack overflow as seen here. In Elixir, since data is immutable but tail calls are optimized, loops can be converted to tail recursive calls where there's relative loop just carried in an accumulator, which by convention is usually ACC because they don't like to spell an accumulator. Um, the base case of the loop then is to return the accumulator, which in here you have to read the F and be like, okay, it's empty, we do this. But in Elixir, it just stands out of that's an empty list. And the only thing we're doing is, is returning the accumulator. And so it's much more obvious and stands out how to do the, the list. So in each of these cases, we're taking a range from 0 to 9,000. Unfortunately, I couldn't get over 9,000. Um, and we're going to say we're going to start it with 0, because that's good for addition. And we're going to try and sum the array, and we get stack level 2 deep. Um, in Elixir, because we have tail call optimization, if you call this, if the last thing you do in a function is call another function, and then that function call would immediately return, we don't build another stack frame. So we're not, this is just one stack frame deep, and it just keeps replacing the locals over and over again. And that's why we can do this huge recursion, and it comes out with the result. And uh, I'll explain what that weird uh, pipe greater than symbol is later. 
So in Ruby, we love our testing. We have many tests. We have Cucumber. We have RSpec. Um, Cucumber is so popular that Java projects write their Cucumber tests in Ruby because the Java interface sucks. <laughs> um, I, I'm not saying that I may have experienced that at companies I work at, but um, so kind of a mapping between the different frameworks. Uh, the equivalent of mini test slash unit is X unit. So if you want assertion-based testing, you know, where you actually have methods called assert. Uh, there is an add-on in Elixir called should I, which gives you the nested context from our spec, but still lets you use the asserts from X unit. Uh, they're, both of them have a faker project. They're both called faker. Like, one's not X faker, one's not Ruby faker. They're just called faker. And that lets you get fake data, like uh, fake company names or fake internet memes. You know, so you can, like the lorem ipsum of models, kind of, is how to think about it. Uh, there is an e spec, there is an R spec like implementation for Elixir called eSpec. Um, so you get expect land callbacks, uh, but I will explain why I don't think that's absolutely necessary with XUnit. And there is a thing to write uh, Gherkin syntax. So Gherkin is the actual text when we write a cucumber file, that's called Gherkin. And so there's a thing called white bread, because you use white bread to make cucumber sandwiches um, to do that in Elixir. If you are gluten-free, you can test framework, huh? Yeah, it, it would probably be really bad, because you need soft white bread for cucumber sandwiches, and there's, nothing, there's no such thing as soft gluten-free bread. <laughs> no. um, so the spec helper for, for our spec is really complicated. But it has a lot of history, and it's very configurable. Uh, XUnit doesn't have as much history, so there is no configuration. Um, it is just XUnit.start. And this start goes back to what I talked about of the uh, applications and uh, process trees. Is This is saying start the XUnit um, process tree before you start all the tests. And um, the reason why we want a tree is we get support for async. Uh, so as mentioned on the testing framework slide, XUnit is closer to mini tests than our specs. So like mini tests, XUnit uses standard modules to define tests inside. But more like our spec, XUnit uses a test DSL to define tests. When I, while our spec is known for ex extensive expect and match DSL, XUnit just uses assert and normal comparison operations. So it's not assert equals. It's just the word assert, and they use normal double equals. I'll explain why that works later. Um, as you know, the box supports running parallel, uh, running tests in parallel using the async true option right here. Um, to get parallel tests with RSpec, you need to use the parallel test gem. And I don't know if anyone else is using it, has used it before, but it uses multiple processes because it's Ruby and it has to. But it is also, um, it'll mix the output or either you have to have it launch to a file and only print the output at the end. So it's a, uh, very slow and very hard to monitor when tests fail if you use parallel tests. But if you have a huge number of tests and you need to shrink the time, it is an option. Both RSpec and XUnit say which examples failed and on which line, along with the total, total number of failures. So two examples, two failures. Two tests, two failures. They say the line here, so spec slash example spec at RB, line nine, or line three, Test example, test.exs5 or 10. And uh, they say which opera you use. Our spec claims you use double equals, but I actually had to type the matcher EQ. I couldn't actually use the double equals uh, operator. In XUnit, I can't actually use double equals. So it's more true what it says the comparison is. Our spec tries to show the failing code by using the line of the call, but it only shows the expect name. Here, expect opening parentheses. It doesn't actually show me the full code because in Ruby with our spec, it just it just reads the flat file. Um, on the other hand, XUnit is able to show the original code, including the addition and subtraction. So the code that failed is one minus one equals negative one, or one plus one equals three, and then it says the left hand side of each one. Finally, writing equivalent tests, XUnit is both four times faster at loading the tests. So it takes uh, 0 0.04 seconds versus 0 0.15 seconds for 
R spec and takes less than a hundredth of a second, while R spec takes two hundredths of a second to actually run the tests. And this scaling works true when you um, go up to bigger projects, like the difference between testing a Rails app and testing a um, Phoenix app using XUnit. So if you are a big fan of test-driven uh, development, XUnit might be a good choice because you get faster feedback cycles. Both Ruby and Elixir have built-in coverage libraries, but only Elixir can generate reports using it when running uh, mixed tests dash dash cover. And uh, it is just uh, generates an HTML file under the coverage directory. Uh, if you want to go farther, uh, you can in Ruby you'd have to use the simple cub gem, which is just excellent. I can't recommend it enough. It is great. Um, and you do break spec. And simple cub automatically runs because you had to register simple cub at start at the beginning, and it automatically generates uh, it registers an at exit hook to automatically print out the file at the end, and then you can open uh, coverage uh, for slash index um, But to get the nice uh, ignores that simple cub have, so you can do uh, hash colon no cub colon to be like this section to the next no cub. Don't worry about it. I can't cover this because like it's error handling code. Or it might be code that like only runs for Postgres, but you're doing the SQL tests. Simple cover lets you do that. The only way to do that in Elixir is to use the X coveralls uh, package, and that also gives you access to be able to upload your coverage reports to coveralls.io. If you have an open source project, I recommend coveralls.io because it'll monitor whether your coverage is going up and down without you having to do your own scripts for your simple cover monitoring. Um, one of the hardest things in projects is keeping documentation up to date. Out of date documentation makes your project hard to use as it can confuse the developer. Documentation with examples is better as it goes uh, goes behind the same API description, but those examples can quickly get out of date. To ensure that examples are correct, XUnit has doc test, which can read all the examples in a module and actually check that they're true. So. You have a doc. Uh, you can use here documentation uh, to, to do it. And you have, you have four lines indent. So uh, if it wasn't obvious, the uh, default format for the documentation is markdown. Yay. Instead of rdocs crap. Um, and so if you indent four, that's a code block. And you just pretend that this is an IEX prompt. And you say, I call example that line with one and two. And I expect the, the calculated line number to be three. So then in my example test uh, thing, I just say doc test in the name of the module, and it'll, it'll test all those examples. And here it's like, uh, wait, nope, it's four. You screwed up. So that way you can test your examples, which is very nice. OK. Moving on to metaprogramming. Um, not everyone metaprograms in Ruby, but all of us use DSLs all the time. So it's good to understand how to do the, the mapping in your head, even if you don't plan to write uh, your, do your own metaprogram that often. Um, macros can run at a compile time. They can run any valid Elixir code. And they capture and transform the AST. Uh, AST is the abstract syntax tree. So in the background, Ruby also has an abstract syntax tree. So this, it's called abstract because it doesn't care about white space. It's more of like, semantically, how would you think about like, this is a function call for the foo function. That's what you're capturing. You don't actually care how they did it, whether they did it with parentheses or not. That sort of thing. So Ruby prides itself on its ability to support metaprogram and DSLs, but Ruby still has a lot of keywords. Uh, here I've only included the keywords that are actually uh, not keywords in Elixir. Um, the behavior of those keywords can't be overridden with metaprogramming. Uh, Ruby's keywords can be summarized as, if code needs to be prevented from running, or if it's hidden in the VM, then make it a keyword. Uh, many of the keywords in Ruby didn't have to be keywords. They could have just been implemented as methods that took, took blocks like they are in Smalltalk. But it would have been slower because blocks are a runtime construct. So if you did if with a block, or if true, if you've seen Sandy Metz's uh, talk from the recent conferences. Um, Elixir's block, on the other hand, are compile time constructs, so they can be used for seeming language keywords like and, if, uh, def, def module, or unless. So def module, like defining the module, 
that is a macro. That is something you can define. That's something you can override. That isn't a keyword like modulus in Ruby. That blew my mind when I learned that. It's important to know that some keywords, such as after, else, crash, and rescue, that we saw in the how to uh, capture exceptions and handle them, uh, are allowed in any block. They aren't just restricted to try blocks. It is up to each macro to decide uh, what to do with each keyword. Uh, in either form, the lines of code after the keyword are passed to the macro as AST. So because the compiler knows it's a macro, instead of trying to run the code immediately, so instead of like trying to print immediately with puts, it'll just be like, I'm going to capture what this would do and give it to you as a block, because it knows it's a macro because you were required it. So these two are equivalent. You can either do a do block with an end, or you can do a bunch of keyword arguments. So you can do really short form uh, function one-liner function definitions by doing comma do colon instead of uh, def do end. So this AST capture is really cool because it's how assert works. So when I say assert 1 plus 1 is not equal 2, well, in Ruby, if I did that, OK, assert would be like a function call with no parentheses. So it would just evaluate the not does not equal. And then that would return true or false. And it'd just be like saying assert true or assert false. But because assert is a macro, it actually captures the code that's doing the 1 plus 1 does not equal 2 and can actually print that back out so you can see the code as is. And so, does that e so the way uh, assert is actually written is it's just a bunch of pattern matches with all the support operators. That's all it's doing. And remember I said any valid Elixir code can be run at compile time. This means we can go to an external resource and transform data into code. Here we download the list of known MIME types from the Apache uh, project. And we know the format. So we split on that, and we try to find the MIME types listed in order to calculate the list of valid MIME types. The uncode call transforms the variable my type, which would be a string, into like just pretend in your mind that like you actually said the quoted string literally there. So you can think of uncode as the equivalent of you know hash curly braces, but for code. So it's like interpolation, but for code. Uh, the same approach is used to support the full Unicode because they can read the Unicode database from a text file, and automatically do the mapping from lowercase to uppercase characters as just a bunch of uh, function definitions that use pattern matching. I didn't do this on the AST capture side, but operators are, are captured in the AST, and operators can be redefined because they are just macros. All state has to be returned from a function if not passing messages, and IO is passing messages. So that means function calls have to take the output of a previous function. So you'd either have to deeply nest function calls, like, OK, this is a command line program. Here's our main. We're going to get arg to be in. We're going to parse the args, process those args, and then spit out the output to somewhere. We can do that deeply nested, but you have to read the code you know, from the inside out. Annoying. Uh, the other option is we have a bunch of throwaway arguments. So we parse the args. That goes in parsed args. We pass the parsed args to process, and that becomes processed. And then process finally goes to output. But thinking back to how we use Unix shells, we can create a pipeline. So the pipe greater than symbol is called the pipeline operator because it allows you to pipe the output of one function to the input of the next function in the pipeline. And here's its definition, which is pretty simple. We're going to unpipe this pipeline here into a list of, so the most disappearing, like we're going to be RV, parse arg, process output. And then we're going to just Shoving the output of argv, so all it does is it takes this construct, which you can read in order to be like, I get argv, I parse it, I process it, and I output it, and it'll go back to this deeply nested form before it's compiled. So finally, one of the best parts of Elixir, the concurrency. So simple message passing. Uh, I spawn a process passing in an anonymous function with the fn keyword. Um, and have it wait to receive a ping. So I just do a receive block, and I say I want to get a ping, and who pinged me? Uh, 
When it receives ping, it will respond to the sender with Pong. Receive will wait for message to be received or pick up the first message that matches from the process mailbox. So there's not a race condition like there would be in some other frameworks to be like, if I don't listen and the message already came, it's gone. Because these process, because these messages um, are part of the Erlang VM, they will be sitting there waiting if you didn't receive right away, which is nice. Um, there are no objects in Elixir, so self returns the current pro process processes process ID or PID instead, which you can see here. So I'm going to send the process I spawned ping with my PID so that it can pong back with me when I flush my messages. Um, you can think of processes almost like objects in that way, in that there's a self, and it's a um, processes are allowed to manipulate state because they can do loops in function calls. And so as you do a loop, by doing a recursive function call, you can change the local variables on the stack, and there, that way mutate state. But you're safe from all the threading bugs you'd normally have. So that was fine, but could you just do something similar with threads and celluloid? Well, with threads, you're going to use more resources. Elixir processes, an Elixir process is only uh, 2,680 bytes of memory. Threads on OS X are one kilobyte in the kernel and 512 kilobytes for the user land stack, but you can get as low as 16 kilobytes. So I said back in the overview that I could run as many processes as I want effectively, but how many can I really run? The next few slides we'll walk through to show how to test the limits of the process count. So I start with uh, a run function that's going to start a timer uh, and going to benchmark the create process call. And it's going to print out how many microseconds. Remember, microseconds, not milliseconds this takes. Create process itself will create a chain of processes in memory using reduce, which people may be used to from innumerable and Ruby. So we're going to start from 1 to n, the number of processes we want. We're going to start out with this process self at the beginning. And we're just going to spawn another process uh, using the counter function. And we're going to have it send to the current one, uh, the current end of the chain. So this way, we're going to have a chain of like, you send to that guy. It's like going to be a bucket brigade of like, pass the water over, 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 over again. Counter itself, it's just what it says. All it does is count. So we're going to spawn a bunch of processes and just add one. It's not a very useful thing for concurrency. It's just a very good demo because the processes have to start up, do useful work, and shut back down. So when I run that uh, on the command line, I can run uh, 1 million processes. And the result is in 11,658,000. 1,944 microseconds. So million microseconds is just seconds. So that's a million processes in 11 seconds on this laptop. This is an old MacBook Pro, like over three years old. That means each process takes 11.7 microseconds to spawn, do its work, and go on to the next process. Uh, for reference, Apple's own measurements uh, from their uh, developer documentation say it takes 90 micro microseconds to just spawn a thread. But the OS thread limit is 10,240 on this machine. And it gets slightly bigger with newer Macs, but not up to a million. So if you've been interested by this talk and want to learn more about Elixir, uh, here's how to map your go-to resources in Ruby to uh, the equivalent in Elixir. Um, unfortunately, the, the Ruby homepage doesn't have, like, this is the official Ruby guide to Ruby. A lot of people like Wise Poignant Guide, but it's very old now. Um, but there is a very good getting started uh, link just on the elixirlang.org uh, website. Uh, there's a How I Start article uh, where uh, Steve Klabnik does a gem to read the article you're reading in Ruby, and there's one that uh, lets you make a portal gun using processes for Elixir. Um, Learn X and Y has a Ruby version and an Elixir version, which is like this talk, but you know, much faster. Um, for help, the, they both have IRC channels. They're both called lang-lang. Um, I can't vouch 
for the IRC channel for Ruby or the Google group. Uh, the meetups are both great. Um, but I can't, I can't, <coughs> sorry. I cannot emphasize enough how helpful the Elixir Lang IRC channel and Google group are. Uh, Jose Valim, the creator of Elixir, is involved in both and often gives very detailed answers explaining the reasoning behind Elixir. Uh, Jose Valim is also very appreciative of bug reports and pull requests and often gives emoji hearts in mini rainbow colors to reporters and contributors. It's a very encouraging community. Um, they also love documentation. The, the, the uh, Getting Star Guide for Elixir was all done by one guy as an open source contribution. And so there's lots of places to contribute to the community because it's, it's still pretty young. Erlang has a 25 year history, but Elixir itself has barely three. Uh, for videos, if you like to learn your Ruby with Ruby Tapas and Avdi, you can uh, switch over to Elixir SIPs for Elixir. Um, a lot of the Ruby conference videos are by Confreaks on YouTube. You can either go to the InfoQ website or look at Erlang Solutions channel on YouTube for the equivalent talks for Elixir. Um, for books, I didn't do a mapping just because I learned Ruby on the job and not through books. And so I don't really know the good starter books for Ruby like I do on Elixir. Um, I'd recommend starting with Dave Thomas's Programming Elixir book because it shows you how to do uh, sequential Elixir. So it's like it's functional, but you're not doing concurrency, then do concurrency, and a little bit of macros. Uh, Elixir in action is a great way to get your mind around how do I effectively use Elixir to make it not just Ruby code anymore. So it's, it takes a simple to-do app on the command line, like on this date, do this thing. It makes it concurrent, uh, fault tolerant. So like if you have a, you have different processes managing different to-do lists, and all the way up to a web service that can handle tens of thousands of requests using real production code uh, like Cowboy for the web server. And that's all running on a laptop. That's not like 10,000 requests running on a beefy server. Like the, the memory and CPU utilization is so much more efficient with Elixir and Erlang than it is with what we're used to on Ruby. And if you're interested in the stuff I talked about with macros, um, Chris McCord's Metaprogramming Elixir book uh, covers that. Uh, the official websites are both dash lang.org. And uh, they both have an awesome project, but Elixir's was first. So the, the awesome lists are these GitHub repositories where, like, I want to do authentication. You look down the list. Here are the projects that do authentication. So it's a, a very good, like, community-generated and curated list of, I want an editor. OK, what's, like, the Vim plugin for Elixir? What's the Vim plugin for Ruby? Um, so they're very helpful uh, if Ruby Toolbox is out of date, which it's not very well maintained anymore. Um, for editors, I haven't used Emacs in like seven years now, so I can't recommend one for Ruby. Um, but for Elixir right now, uh, a tool called Alchemist is uh, dominating so much that a lot of people are switching. A lot of people that like Vim are actually switching to Space Emacs, which has evil mode, which emulates Vim on Emacs to use Alchemist. Um, like I said previously, uh, if you like the JetBrains IDs like RubyMine, I uh, maintain the plugin called IntelliJ Elixir that I'll give you Elixir support inside of IntelliJ Community Edition or RubyMind or any of the other JetBrains IDs. And Vim has Vim Ruby and Vim Elixir. Uh, updating dates to be aware of in the Elixir and Ruby community. Uh, this Wednesday at 7 PM at my work, Rapid7, uh, at the intersection of 183 and Mopac, there will be a talk on uh, Erlang's OTP framework, which is the part of Erlang that goes beyond just simple process linking to supervision trees and how to make a really resilient app, you know, to the level of, you know, embedded switches where you can pull out hardware and it keeps running. Um, it'll also then cover how to use a database called RethinkDB with Phoenix, which is the Elixir component of Rails, um, and how to push that out over uh, Phoenix channels, which are, is the web sockets for Phoenix. And so that might be interest to you if you're uh, contemplating whether to go to Rails 5 for their web socket support, but have to do all your code in an event machine for the socket part. Um, if you want to switch from Rails to Phoenix, there is a two-day dedicated Phoenix training course um, coming up immediately before Lone Star Ruby, 
uh, Lone Star Ruby is on the 15th. Uh, the next big conference isn't until October with Elixir Conf, which is also in town. Um, Keep Ruby Weird is later in the month on the 23rd. Uh, that's a one-day conference. And RubyConf is all the way in November, and that's um, going to be in San Antonio. And that's it.